Hey guys, welcome back. This is your host, PhilPhoneDecage.com. Today we're going to take a look on the Samsung Galaxy Z Flip. Now, before we go any further, the question that I get asked a lot is, is it useful? Does it mean anything to actually flip the phone? The short personal answer is not for me. You see, through the week with this phone, I realized how addicted I am to smartphones. I use it virtually all the time while I'm not working, and that means this has to remain open pretty much almost all the time. Now, if it was easy to flip it and open it back up, it wouldn't have been a problem. But unlike the old flip phones where it had a spring assisted tension that you can just flick over, you can can't do that with this one. This has free stop hinge, so it does not semi-automatically opens or flips. The right way would be to use both of your hands, but I'm a lazy person. So I ended up just using one of my body parts to open and close it back up. Now, of course, this free stop hinge is useful in certain situations like time lapse, selfie, and video calls. And it is definitely easier to carry around in your pants pockets, but I don't see any more merits over the standard bar-shaped phones. All right, aside from all the practicalities, let's talk about the design. This is one of the phones that looks better in real life than in stock photos. It's square, it blings, it's not boring at all, although it does look like a standard bar phone sliced in half on back. Although if you ask about the colors, I would definitely go for the black one. Not only does it look better, but also there is a practical reason behind that, but more on that later. Now, some people complain that it's too thick. Yes, that is true compared to the bar-shaped phones, but if you compare it with the old school flip phones, the, the classic flip phones that ain't smart, you can see that they're pretty much the same, unless you bring the super slim phones like Razer. My complaints rather is that it's too wide. Uh, they're really hard to fit in in the shirt pockets and they're quite heavy at 183 grams. Shirt pockets are definitely not where you wanna keep them. And like all the other foldable phones, this is not weather protected, so make sure not to drop it in the water. Now to the real deal. When you open it up, it reveals the 6.7 inches of Full HD Plus AMOLED panel. There is a visible crease in the middle and you can also feel it. Just like one in the Galaxy Fold, I quickly got used to it, but some of my friends never could. While the very top layer is covered by plastic parts, under that is the ultra-thin glass, shortened UTG. Visually, it doesn't look much different, but when you try to tap on it, it does feel a lot sturdier. Just like any other modern smartphones, this also supports HDR10+, and always on display when the screen is off. The colors are nice and accurate, you can even customize it with the white balance or RGMB, respectively. And you might have noticed that it's got a very long screen, it's 21.9 by 9, it's beyond cinematic ratio. Sure, it goes nice with very limited number of videos and multi-active split screen, but even with the one-hand control mode, it's too long. I often found it super tricky to reach the ones on top. Since this is a foldable phone, you get another display on the front. This is 1.1 inches of external screen. This is touch enabled so you can tap twice to turn it on or you can surely use the power button on the side. You can look at the notifications, read what they're saying. You can check charging status, answer or reject calls or control music. And there's even a camera preview. Now this is where the black one is better than the purple one. The outer screen of the purple one is tinted in purple. And for God's sake, they're way too small. Compare that with the old school flip phone. They even had larger screen than this. And these were also touch enabled. I'm so sure that they're gonna put a larger one in the next generation. All right, now to the performance department. You can unlock it with the fingerprint reader on this side or use a face recognition with the front facing camera. The fingerprint sensor position isn't the best, but you kind of get used to it. You can use it with the right thumb or the left index or middle finger. They even managed to put the little gesture control where you can swipe on the fingerprint reader to bring down the notification bar, but it is way too sensitive. I ended up turning that off. Since we're talking about the gestures, you can change the button order or switch to the full screen gestures. There are two different ones. There is a classic swipe from bottom, back home and multitasking or vice versa, or the Android 10 style swipe from size and bottom. You can just swipe, swipe and hold for multitasking or swipe on the side for back. The downside to this one is that it's only supported with the stock launcher. Specs wise, it's got Snapdragon 855 Plus, 8GB of RAM, and 256GB of UFS 3.0 storage without a microSD card slot. Sure, this is not the latest chipset, but certainly not lacking. The thing is, I don't know if it's chipset or the overall optimization, but it's actually pretty smooth. It's quite snappy, especially when quickly switching between the apps, like tapping that twice. The animations are so much smoother than I recall. There are usual goodies like the dark mode, edge lighting for your notifications, Samsung 
custom pay for supportive regions, and of course the screen recorder hidden in the second tab of the quick tiles. The thing that is lacking are Wi-Fi 6, USB 3.1, this one's got 2.0, and Samsung DeX support. I don't know why they took that off, but it was just getting better with the quick cable connection, but it does come with the eSIM support so you can use your physical and eSIM as a dual SIM device. Now to the camera department, on the back, or rather flipped front, it's got f1.8 of wide camera with the OIS, and f2.2 of 123 degrees of super wide angle camera. You can quickly tap twice on the power key to launch camera, whether flipped or opened. The interface is pretty standard, except for the little button over here that turns on cover display preview, so the person on the opposite side can also look what's happening on the camera. Now the main camera isn't anything special, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't perform. The daylight photos are great, for some reason the details gotten better, look at the little furs and hairs with the nice color reproductions. The low light photos are also nice, it doesn't surprise you, but it does a nice job with the dedicated night mode even without the dual aperture lens. Now the super wide angle cameras are also better than I thought. The super wide angle lenses essentially zip everything inside a little frame, so the detail has to be nice, and the resolution is high enough and it's bright enough, so they produce some pretty good photos even under low lighting conditions. The bokeh effects hidden under more section by default also is pretty nice, it's quick, it does a nice job with the outer lines, but they could have been sharper, you know the details are lost when you apply it. I've definitely seen better ones. And it's 2020, lack of optical zoom could be a problem for some people. And and also the selfie cam is pretty dark at f2.4, it does have a nice interface when it flips, the viewfinder automatically snaps up to the front, let's see that again, open you see the whole view, as you flip it, it goes up, and controls are also in the better position. Unlike the well built interface, the results are not the best, especially under low lighting conditions, but I do like the fact that it's autofocus enabled. Now for the audio, surprisingly it does not come with the stereo speaker, the one on bottom is the only one you get. Thankfully, that single speaker is okay. The volume is loud and the sound quality is okay. It's far better than Samsung's other mono speakers. I was worried. As a pricey 2020 device, it does not come with the 3.5mm headphone jack, you have to rely on the USB-C port or wireless, and it doesn't come with the adapter. What it does come with are a number of options including Dolby Atmos, only for your headphones, equalizer, customizable, UHQ upscalers, and adapt sound that finds the best sound for you. Now battery was something I was worried about, it has dual cell combined at 3300mAh of capacity and it gave me a very stable 6 hours of screen on time. Sure it's not the best, but I'm always on the LTE network, never on Wi-Fi. always surf the web with the mostly white background, so most of you should be getting even longer, and again 6 hours of screen on time is long enough to last for the entire day. Via the USB-C port on the bottom, it supports a little dated 15 watts of fast charging, for 30 minutes you get 48%, an hour for 83 an hour and a half and you're already full at 97%. Another 10 minutes give you full capacity. There's also fast wireless charging through the bottom half that gives you 38% for half an hour, 74% for an hour, again almost full of 96% at hour and a half, and an hour and 40 minutes gives you full power. And of course there's a wireless power share so you can use it to charge another Galaxy device or Galaxy Buds, your smartwatch, or even your iPhone, basically any other Qi certified device. And now the conclusion, the Galaxy Z Flip is a very well built first generation flip foldable smartphone. I don't know which came first, form or function, but they also came up with the nice use cases as well. Halfway open video calls, selfies, time lapse photos, or you know, split multitasking. And that's about time when the first question comes back. Is it practical? Is there any reason for you to fold your phone? Cause you know, with the Galaxy Fold, you had a larger screen. It was essentially a foldable tablet. Carrying around a larger screen in your pocket was the practical reason to fold. So again, why flip? That I haven't found the answer yet. It could give you better selfies and the video calls are easier. And I do like the fact that it's not as annoying in my pants pocket when I'm tying my shoelaces. But is that a reason good enough to spend $13.99 for? You know, it's a very fun toy and everyone around you is going to ask if they can have a look. And to be fair, it's a great phone. It does everything you expect a phone to do. You don't miss out that much compared to something like, you know, a Galaxy S20 Plus. But if you want my 20 cents on it, don't buy it just yet. Just like the Galaxy Fold, that's also first generation. There are so many things that I can see that they're going to bring on the second generation. Let me guess, larger external screen, more camera lenses, even better battery life, slimmer and lighter, and maybe it's even going to get cheaper too. So I'll give you the same conclusion that I gave to the Galaxy Fold. It's a great 
amazingly well-built first-generation devices that you don't want to buy just yet. I really like the Galaxy Z Flip. I just don't see the reason why I want to spend that much on this. All right, so that was the Samsung Galaxy Z Flip, a return of the old school flip phone look, just like the Motorola Razr, but you know, sturdier. If you have any questions, please leave them down in the comment section below. You can always see us on Facebook and Instagram. We'll see you guys later. Ciao.